Hello, welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Damon Wade. I'm director of the North Carolina Botanical Garden. So glad to have you here for the 2023 Darwin Day lecture. Hi to all the people who are on Zoom watching this uh, remotely. Welcome to you as well. Um, yeah, I, I thought it'd be really appropriate to share with you our the garden statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's all about biodiversity, and Darwin was all about biodiversity. So, um, you know, as a garden that's focused on the conservation of biodiversity of southeastern native plants, we recognize just as biodiversity is critical to a healthy ecosystem, diversity in people and perspectives make our organization and community stronger. And the garden is committed to creating an environment in our gardens and natural areas where everyone's voice is heard and everyone feels safe and welcome. And I can only imagine if Charles Darwin had debuted the origin of the species here, um, we would have welcomed him as well. Um, it would not have been as controversial as it was back in the day. So the, uh, also, uh, I'd like to recognize that the garden is... Um, that the lands we steward are the ancestral homeland of several Siouan speaking tribes and a part of the recognized home of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. And we celebrate the many Native people who to this day meet, gather, walk, and hike and engage with the habitats and gardens on this land. And we honor their Native ancestors and elders, past, present, and future. So the um, you might have noticed that this. Uh, particular lecture, we're collaborating with a new organization um, on campus, or not just on campus, but everywhere, called the Carolina Biodiversity Collaborative. And there's the web address right next to the title. I wanted to make you aware of that. We just started it up last year, and it's in response to the global biodiversity crisis. And we feel like this area, the triangle with all its universities and research that's happening with biodiversity, and being home to really some really charismatic endemic species is ripe for a collaborative um, among the different institutions who look at biodiversity. So let me just tell you a little bit who we are right now, and this is always ready to be expanded. Um, UNC faculty who do biodiversity research, the North Carolina Botanical Garden and the Herbarium, and also the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science. We held a biodiversity forum last year, and so um, the collaborative hosts events like this to um, promote and advocate for biodiversity research. A lot of emphasis is put on training the next generation of scientists or people seeking careers in biodiversity, and we really want to enhance public understanding about the value of biodiversity. So just a really natural fit for this 2023 Darwin Day lecture. Um, so um, I don't, I can't take any credit for these Darwin Day lectures. This has been a passion project of Dr. Johnny Randall, who's our director of conservation programs here at the Garden. I think since 2008, he's been organizing the Darwin Day lecture on uh, Darwin and Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And that reminds me, we do have two very large birthday cakes waiting for you after this lecture. Uh, we'll move over after the Q&A session, we'll move over to the um, Peg Exhibit Hall and celebrate uh, both of those birthdays. So um, let's give Johnny a big hand for pulling this together all these years. Well, thanks, Damon, and thank you all for showing up. And I certainly did not need any um, applause for that. This is uh, something that I feel is very important to recognize Charles Darwin on his birthday or near bouts as well as Abraham Lincoln. They're both two incredible people who did incredible things. One freed people's minds to think about science as important, and the other freed a lot of other people. Um, so um, I really appreciate these two uh, gentlemen. And it's always a nice thing to keep this in context that they were born just hours apart. Some people might think Darwin was, you know, really, you know, like back with Aristotle or something, but um, but he was really almost a contemporary of us. You know, this was not that long ago that um, his ideas on evolutionary biology um, came to came to light. But um, 
I do want to also point out that there are about 100 people here uh, in person and about 150 people online. So thank you all for tuning in from, from all over the place. Uh, they are uh, they're registrants from all over the East Coast, California, Arkansas, Indiana, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, Ohio, and Tennessee. So thank you all for tuning in. This is great. I'm just going to go through a few slides to talk about, oh, great, the uh, uh, closed captioning is working now. Um, so um, I can't see what's up there, so I need to step out a little bit. Um, so this is just um, a little bit of information on our 16th annual uh, Darwin Day event, and these are all the speakers thus far. And we are pre really appreciate all these people who have uh, donated their time to talk about this very important subject. And we are not alone uh, in hosting a Darwin Day event. Um, I only learned after I started organizing these that there's an international effort and that people are doing what we are doing today all over the world. Um, and this one um, was registered on the International Darwin Day site. And so hopefully people from other countries are tuning in as well. I'm not sure if we had any international guests or not, but um, but anyway, uh, we are part of a much larger effort to keep the idea of Darwin in people's minds and what he contributed to science, especially since science keeps continuously is beaten up, you know, and assaulted. And it's so important for us to, to do this, not only for a Darwin Day event, but, but all of our programs here at the Botanical Garden um, are all science-based. And so, um, I really appreciate that about this institution. Um, there's just some select Darwin biography information. Um, I'm not going to go through this by any means, um, but uh, the next one I think is important uh, because there were two things that Darwin really paid attention to, and that was plants. Um, he did a lot of work with the breeding of plants and the understanding of pollination biology, and he loved insectivorous plants, and he was the one who actually figured out how the Venus flytrap worked, the closing mechanism. Um, um, but also he was very interested in humans um, and uh, behavior and things like that. So we're gonna hear more about uh, some human stuff today, which is great. And he was also interested in worms. That was his last volume, which was really impressive because it kind of pulled in a lot of what he had studied throughout his life. But one thing I recently learned about Darwin is that in the last days before his death, he lamented the fact that he didn't spend more time reading poetry and listening to music. So let that be a lesson to all of us to smell the Rosa Palestris every now and then. Okay. Um, and uh, my family and I took a pilgrimage to uh, Downhouse, uh, Darwin's home and his laboratory um, some years ago. And I talked about that one of, in one of these Darwin Day events. But I learned um, a few years ago that uh, UNC had received a, a first edition of um, On the Origin of Species. And I went up um, a few months ago on a, a small pilgrimage to see this volume. And it was really great to, um, to actually hold and, and, and thumb through and look at a first edition of On the Origin of Species. There aren't that many around anymore. And I think they go for a pretty high pop price. Okay. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today now, finally get around the, getting around to this. But um, so Corinne Finning um, is a professor of biology here at UNC. Um, her husband, David, gave our Darwin Day um, uh, address in 2019. Um, so it's definitely her turn um, uh, to do this. And uh, so we're gonna talk about hybrids today. and. Uh, so uh, the strictest sense of a hybrid is the, the offspring of two individuals of the same species. And uh, one of the Fennig's um, hybrids is actually here in the audience today. And hopefully their other, uh, their other hybrid is tuning in um, um, remotely. But Darwin was, he knew all about hybridization. He did so many breeding experiments with plants and um, and he knew all, you know, much about animal hybridization and uh, domestication but he, it was still vexing to him how this actually occurred um, because he didn't know anything about uh, particulate uh, inheritance. Um, he discovered so much about genetics, it's amazing. He discovered alleles, like alleles that 
um, will uh, prevent uh, closely related plants or within the same species from interbreeding with one another. So you wanted to not interbreed with yourself, but to outcross. So anyway, he knew about alleles, he knew about inheritance, he just didn't know how it worked. Okay. Um, so more about <clears throat> Corinne Finnig. Uh, the, I'm just, I'm not gonna read, I'm gonna let you read that. I can't read it from the side uh, very well, but these are the things that she studies and you'll learn um, a lot more about those particular subjects today. And if you want to go to that website, um, her lab website, there is a 20 page Vita uh, that uh, is very impressive. And I'm only going to mention a couple of things um, or not even mention them, but just demonstrate that uh, there are some recent publications um, of about 70, which are really, uh, I've gone through a lot of these really interesting titles. Okay. And co-authored a book with her husband recently um, and wrote a book chapter and uh, some recent awards. So, um, and these are only recent ones. She's received many. So one more, and I think we can get going. So Corinne Finnick, thank you for coming. Thank you all um, for coming today. It is so fun to be able to celebrate Darwin's birthday with you today. And um, what I'm gonna be doing is talking about the hybrid in your genome. So basically looking at how recent advances in behavior and genomics are um, basically sort of changing our view of Darwinian evolution. And so to begin, what I wanna do is I wanna start with a thought experiment. I want you to imagine what the world would look like if there was just one type of life and if that life were um, spread evenly across the planet. And you can imagine that that's really different from what our planet actually looks like. So obviously we live on a world that is remarkable in its diversity of life. And that life is not spread equally across the planet. Instead, you know, the plants and animals we see here in central North Carolina are really different from what we see in the mountains of North Carolina. And that's really different from what we might see in California or Alaska. So for many of us who are evolutionary biologists and ecologists, the question we ask is, why does the world look like this as opposed to that alternative? And an answer that came to us was from Darwin, okay? And Darwin's um, grand theory of evolution by natural selection really provides us with the fundamental answer to this question. And that's why I think it is so important and why we celebrate his birthday today. So basically what Darwin gave us was thinking about evolution as a tree. And so what Darwin highlighted in thinking about this tree um, of diversity is that we can describe evolution and biodiversity in terms of both splits, but also in terms of divergence between those. In other words, what Darwin basically did was introduce the idea of tree thinking into um, evolution by proposing that species arise when ancestral lineages or populations split from one another and adapt to new habitats. And so basically what Darwin provided us with this new metaphor for life, which is the tree of life that we now think about today. Now, the premise of what I wanna talk about today is that new data on hybridization, so what we might, what we call interbreeding between species, so hybridization, these new data are changing our understanding of this tree of life. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna start by going into a little bit more detail for how um, splitting occurs. So basically I wanna walk you through the ideas for how do new species arise? Where does the origin of species come from in Dar Darwin's origin of species? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn to new work on hybridization that challenges this tree thinking a little bit. And then finally, we're gonna discuss the implications of these new data for understanding biodiversity, but also the problems that we um, face in thinking about biodiversity. Okay, so before I do that though, what I wanna do is just walk you through Darwin's idea about how natural selection can lead to adaptation. 
So I just want to get us on the same page before we dive into understanding how new species arise. So basically what Darwin observed is that if you go into any population, you see variation. So if you look at all of us in this room, we're all different from one another. We're not identical in how we look or how we behave. And so if we look at a cartoon like what I'm showing here up on the top left, we've got beetles that are green and orange and they're sitting on this brown background. So this variation we find in all populations. Now what Darwin also noticed though, is that because of this variation, there are differences between individuals in their likelihood of reproducing and surviving. So in our example of the beetles here, the green beetles stand out on that brown background more, and so they're more apparent to predators, and they're more likely to be eaten by bird predators, okay? Now, if there is inheritance of those traits, what's going to happen is that the orange beetles are going to leave behind more orange beetles, and because there are more of them, because they survived, what's ha happened over in the population over time is we get evolution. So over time, what we're going to get then is more orange beetles in this population. So that's adaptive evolution in a nutshell right there. Okay. Now, this idea is incredibly powerful. And again, this is why we're here celebrating him today, is that this process can explain why species look so well fitted to their particular habitat, this process of natural selection. The other thing that really stands out about this process is that it's basically an algorithm. If you have variation and differential survival and inheritance, you will always get adaptive evolution. It's a recipe. So basically, if you follow the recipe for chocolate cake, you always get chocolate cake, right? You never get cheese pizza. And it's the same thing with evolution by natural selection. If you have these three components in place, you always get adaptive evolution. Okay, so we've got evolution by natural selection. Well, how does that lead to new species? Well, the idea is that if you have adaptation to different environments, that can lead to splitting or the origins of new species, what we call the process of speciation. And actually, I'm going to take my mask off. Can people hear me a little bit better this way? Okay, I can breathe a little better too. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to take you through an example of how speciation can occur using a real example. So these are insects. This is work by Patrick Nosel and his colleagues. And these are insects um, found on different types of host, their host plants, the plants where they live out in um, the Western United States. And so we have um, on your left, an unstriped form that's found most commonly on what we call host plant C. And on the right, it's a little bit hard to see, I can point it here, are striped forms of the insect that are found more commonly on host plant A. Now, if we look at survival of these different forms, what we find, like the beetle example I just gave you, is that each of the forms survives best on its own host plant. Okay, so if you look on the left there on host plant C, so I have survival here on the Y axis for each of these, what you see is that the unstriped form has high survival on its host plant, but that striped form, it gets eaten by predators because it stands out against that background. But the opposite's true in host plant A, where it's the stripedy form that is the one that has higher fitness and the unstriped form that stands out and gets eaten by predators. So this is what we expect if there's natural selection favoring these two forms that are adapted to these different host plants. Now, what you can also see is that they, they hybridize and they'll produce hybrids. And those hybrids are shown in the picture up there on top, which are, they're intermediate. So they carry traits of both of the parent types. And what we see is if we look at survival of these hybrids on these host plants, the hybrids do badly on both of, both of these habitats. And the reason for this is that they're carrying traits of both parents, and because they're carrying traits of both parents, they're basically rotten at both habitats, okay? So if we look at host plant C here, these, the hybrids have a little bit of a stripe that makes them stand out and be more likely to be eaten. But if we put them on host plant A, they're not striped enough. Okay, so they are not as well adapted to either 
of these habitats. And so what that means is that we get now natural selection against the production of hybrids, okay? Because if you're on either of these host plants, it's bad to mate with insects from the alternative host type because your offspring are not going to do very well. And so what we find is that natural selection then in turn favors the evolution of traits and behaviors that um, fosters mating within each of these habitat types. So um, what I'm showing here with the, the hearts without the cross is that they are more likely to mate with each other in the habitats and they're selecting against mating with insects across the habitat types. So we call this um, restricted reproduction. We call this reproductive isolation, and that's essentially how we define species. So reproductive isolation means that groups of organisms are um, not going to exchange genes with one another. In other words, there's no gene flow between them. And so those lineages are basically evolving independently from one another. So we call these separate species. So these insects are separate species in this example here. All right. Now, if we return back to Darwin, um, and as Johnny emphasized, hybridization was an important question to Darwin because he asked how, given what I just described about how natural selection leads to splitting, he asked, why does hybridization occur? And he devoted an entire chapter of the origin of species to consider the problem of hybrids. And he was an amazing naturalist who surveyed, who knew about all these instances of hybridization, surveyed that. And what he noted is that hybrids are often sterile. They're often unlikely to survive. It was, as we just saw with the, the insects, and they're often poor competitors relative to the so-called pure species types. And so what he concluded from that is that in general, natural selection should never favor hybridization. Hybridization is a bad thing. And so if we go um, to the tree of life here, then what this implies, what Darwin's thinking implies is that, well, if we have um, splits and divergence, once those splits occur, we should not get hybridization between them, okay? We should not see hybridization happening. Okay, so if that's the case, um, what we would expect is that we should see evidence of this and work since Darwin has sort of borne out these ideas. So look, if we look at a lot of species, most species have actually evolved traits that somehow prevent them from producing hybrids. So if we look at um, many animals, they have mating signals. So birdsong is often used to be able to discriminate species and make sure that they mate with the right species. Different plants have different pollinators that ensure that they don't hybridize. If we look at insects, insects have what we call lock and key mechanisms. So these are actual um, differences in genitalia that make it physically impossible for them to reproduce with one another. If we look at marine organisms, marine organisms that just sort of broadcast their sperm and eggs into the ocean, chemical compatibilities are required for the sperm to fertilize those eggs. And if they're different species, those chemical incompatibilities prevent fertilization from happening. So it reduces hybridization. And then even in the cases where hybrid, hybridization happens, those hybrid offspring are often sterile, meaning that they can't reproduce themselves. And so there's not going to be any gene flow or gene exchange between those species. And this is sort of the poster child for that that I'm showing here in the bottom right. These are mules, which is a cross between a horse and a donkey. You get sterile mules. You're not gonna get any gene flow between horses and donkeys, okay? So that's all great. Um, and yet what has happened is that new genomic data are coming out to reveal that there's a lot more hybridization and gene flow happening across the tree of life than we expected, a lot more than we were aware of. Um, and so in particular, if we look at some examples of this, we see there's some something strange is going on that we didn't expect. So let's look at some bacteria. If we look at bacteria and you look at the lower left here um, on your panel, if we just look at genes for a, a small number of genes for a group of bacteria for 181 species, we get the classic tree approach or tree um, typology or tree image um, for their relationships to one another. 
But on the right, if we look more extensively across their genomes and sequence those genomes, we see a lot of exchanging of genes, so much so that we actually lose that tree image, all right? Now, some people have said, well, bacteria are kind of weird. We're not even sure what a species is in bacteria. So maybe bacteria are just weird. But botanists have known for a really long time that plants hybridize. And one of the things that we see are examples like this here, which is really um, quite remarkable. These are two species of um, sunflower at the top here. That species below, and I say species, is a product of hybridization between those two. So it actually, these hybrids reproduce with themselves and not with the parents. They've even invaded into a new habitat that the parent species can't get into. So we have a species that has arisen because of hybridization. And I'm gonna circle back to some of this in a little bit. But okay, so plants do it, do we see it in animals? And the answer is yes, yes we do. Okay, so again, genomic sequencing is revealing that it is much more common to exchange genes among animals than we expected. And this is a homegrown example here. This is a red wolf shown at the bottom. And genome sequencing of the red, so sequencing of the red wolf genome has revealed that it carries in its ancestry the gray wolf and also coyotes. So animals do it but also even humans do it. So this is um, Svante Pavo, who won the um, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in, last year, 2022. And he won the Nobel Prize for his work sequencing humans and archaic humans and looking at the evolutionary history of humans. And in 2010, um, the, the genome of Neanderthals were sequenced using ancient DNA. And what was found is that about one to two percent of um, that the majority of Eurasians carry about one to two percent of Neanderthal geno DNA in their genome. So if you look around this room, many of us in this room are actually hybrids. So hybridization is common, and it probably happened more than once in our evolutionary history. And one of the things I want to flag is this hybridization event here. This is with another archaic species, so different from Neanderthals. Denisovans are a species that has been described, um, were initially described entirely from genome sequence that was obtained from a fossil finger bone, so a tiny little bone. And it's been shown that many, um, especially um, Asians and Aboriginal Australians, contain um, Denisovan DNA in their genome. So I, full disclosure, I have both Neanderthals and Denisovans in my genome. So I'm like a, a real hybrid. Um, so, and I'm gonna come back to these later because they're good. This, the, this group is gonna play an important story, part of our story later on. Okay, so all this is to say that hybridization happens, all right? And the question is, well, is it an evolutionary dead end? It doesn't matter in terms of thinking about the tree of life. And so, um, because the alternative is to think about hybridization as just a, ma a mistake, that mistakes happen and maybe it's not all that important evolutionarily. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about my own research with spadefoot toads. And one of the reasons why I love spadefoot toads is that they're really cute, um, first of all. So these guys will actually just fit in the palm of your hand, um, but they're also a really interesting system for studying hybridization. So um, one of the things that makes um, spadefoot toads stand out is that they're among the few frogs that can live in the deserts of the Southwestern United States. So every year we pack up the family, as it was, um, as Johnny mentioned, we pack up the car and we head to southeastern Arizona where we do our work. And this is what the habitat looks like. This is Chihuahuan Desert. And um, you might be thinking that deserts are really bad place for frogs to live. And you'd be right, okay? This is not a very hospitable place for a frog. And the way these guys survive is by spending most of their lives burrowed underground in a state of hibernation. So basically they just go to sleep for most of the year. But what they do is they come out only after summer rainstorms. And it's these summer rainstorms that basically wake the toads up and they'll emerge from their underground burrows. And the males and females breed in ephemeral pools that are created by the rains. And the animals will breed on one night. 
following one of these rainstorms. So it's this remarkable event. And then once the eggs hatch, which is in about a day or two um, of, the, of the eggs from the frogs, then the tadpoles are in a race to get out of the pond before that pond dries. That was weird. Oh, we're echoing. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll echo. Um, so what I wanna emphasize is that these are highly ephemeral pools in the desert. And so um, actually, you know what? I'm gonna just play the calls and then I'll come back a little bit. I wanna play the calls for you and then I'll talk a little more about the natural history. So the males call to attract the females in and as they, um, and then the females can use the calls to get a sense of what, you know, is this the right species to mate with? So um, the first one I'm gonna play is the plain spadefoot toad. Um, and then we'll turn to the Mexican spadefoot. So we can turn the sound on now. Okay, so this is the plain spadefoot. Okay, and now the Mexican spadefoot. Okay, so I told you they were really cute. They are, they're adorable. Um, and so uh, a, a few things that I wanna emphasize about the spadefoots is that, first of all, you can hear how different those calls are, okay? They are really, really different from one another. The other thing I wanna emphasize um, going back to the previous slide is that this is all happening in these really ephemeral pools in the desert. And these ponds often go dry before all of the tadpoles can make it out. And so that picture I was showing you was a picture of a tadpole that had made that transition to land. But in the background were all these other tadpoles that were dying because they weren't gonna make it out. And we can actually go out in, in um, some years and there will be thousands of tadpoles, what we call, I mean, it's sad, tadpole brittle because they basically have dried out and haven't made it out of the pond. And so as a result of that, there's a really um, premium on rapid growth and development in the system. Um, and, a, and spadefoots are among the fastest developing vertebrates. So animals with backbones, they're the fast, among the fastest developing vertebrates on the planet. So they get out really fast. Now going um, into a little bit more detail about the toads. So females, as you heard, these, these calls are really different. So females can use those calls to say, yes, that's my species or no, that's not my species, right? Because they're really different from one another. And we might expect these things to be really different because these are really different species. They're really deeply diverged. What I mean by that is that if we looked at the spadefoot family tree, these two species are the most distantly related in their, um, their group, their genus. And in fact, spade, genetic data shows that these guys diverged about 25 million years ago. So just to get you, give you a sense of scale of what that looks like, we diverged from baboons 25 million years ago. So these guys are really, really different from one another. Okay, so we've got all of that. And so what we would expect if we're thinking in terms of the strict Darwinian thought process about hybridization, generally what we would expect to find and what we do find is that plain spadefoot females, and I'm gonna be talking from the female's point of view because females are the ones who, who sort of choose who to mate with. Females are generally found mated to plain spadefoot males, just like what we would expect. At the same time though, we can go into some ponds and what we find instead is that plain spadefoot females are mating with Mexican spadefoot males. And you might think, well, maybe it's just a mistake, uh, but you know, the calls are really different. Um, but the other thing that's really remarkable about that is that we always find it in this direction. In other words, we always find plain spadefoot females mated to Mexican spadefoot males we never find the opposite pattern. We never find Mexican spadefoot males mated to plains, um, Mexican spadefoot females mated to plains males. And in fact, the pattern is so remarkable that it, it can't be explained by random, random chance, okay? So that led me to ask, well, maybe there's actually a reason that females are doing this. And that led me to ask, well, is there a possible benefit that plains female, plain spadefoot females might get by hybridizing. 
So it turns out if we ask, can they benefit by hybridizing? The short answer is yes, yes, they can. And the reason for that is that hybrid tadpoles develop more rapidly than the plain spadefoot tadpoles. So the hybrid tadpoles are more likely to escape the ponds. They're the ones who, who get all four of their little legs fast and get out onto dry land before that pond dries. And the plain spadefoots are the ones that turn into that tadpole brittle. So this that looks like just specks here, these are dead tadpoles at the bottom of a dry pond. So the plain spadefoots, they basically develop too slowly to get out. At the same time though, it's not all good. It turns out there's some bad to hybridization as well. So when those hybrid tadpoles grow up, the males are sterile. They either produce no sperm or the sperm they do produce is malformed compared to pure species sperm. Now the females though, they have eggs and they can reproduce. But in terms of the males, the males are sterile. So what all this means is that there's some pros of hybridization, but there's also some cons, okay? And so if you're a female plain spadefoot, you're faced with some real, really bad costs to hybridization that you would produce sterile offspring, sterile males, but there's some benefits that you would get fast developing hybrid offspring. And so the question is, well, do females pay attention to these things? And, and where would we expect these pros and cons to sort of, how do they balance out? And so it turns out whether the pros outweigh the cons or the cons outweigh the pros depends on the habitat that a female might breed in. And it turns out that habitat really varies um, across a female's lifetime. And so what I'm showing you, just focusing your attention on the top fig part of the figure here, if you look on the left, this is a, one of our ponds. And what you can see is it is completely full. And that's because this was an incredibly wet year with a lot of rain. This pond is actually pretty huge. So it's basically about the half the size of this room and well over my head, okay? And it's deep, it's long lasting, and it will last long enough for plains tadpoles to get out of it. And so here, you would never wanna hybridize because the plains tadpoles have plenty of time to get out of that pond and you wouldn't want to produce offspring that are sterile. But at the same time, the next, in a different year, so the year before, that same pond, there was hardly any rain that year. And so this was a highly ephemeral pond that you know only went up to about my ankles. So it dried out really, really fast. And so in this kind of environment, it might've been better to hybridize because those tadpoles would have made it out in time and it would be better to hybridize than to have no offspring at all, even if the hybrids have low fertility. So the question is, okay, well, these are frogs. Do they actually pay attention to these kinds of things and change what they do in response to that? And it turns out that, yep, they do. And so basically I wanna walk you through how I evaluate their behavior. So I do these experiments here in North Carolina in my lab at UNC. And one of the things that's lovely about spadefoots is that you can take them and evaluate their behavior by putting them in, in little pools that mimic what their ponds look like. So basically little kiddie pools. And then I play, put speakers in those pools that play calls of males and the females think those speakers are real males. So they hear a call and they go to those speakers thinking this is a male I wanna mate with. And so what I do is I do these kinds of experiments, my um, lab group and I, and we do this, we can do this for this experiment where we gave females either high water that mimicked the pond where it would be bad to hybridize, or we gave them shallow water that mimicked a pond where it might actually be good to hybridize. And then we just look to see, do they go to males of their own species, the calls of their own species or calls to the other species? So if we look at the results of this, what we see is that if you give them the conditions where it's bad to hybridize, the females prefer to mate with males of their own species. So they won't hybridize when it's bad to do so. But if you take those same females, so exactly the same females, and now give them a habitat that is where it's actually beneficial to hybridize, they switch their preferences and they start preferring males of a different species. And they'll pre preferentially hybridize. So they'll mate with Mexican spadefoot males. So this is really cool because basically the females are sort of assessing the environment and is it bad to hybridize or good to hybridize? And they're modifying their behavior to do that. 
It gets even cooler than that though. So one of my former graduate students has found, um, Catherine Chen found that, okay, well, these females don't just mate randomly with any old Mexican spadefoot male. They actually listen really carefully to the calls of the Mexican spadefoot and they will prefer the males that produce the best quality hybrid offspring. And I can tell you a little bit more about that experiment in the question and answer, but these females have really fine scale discrimination and choice behavior to sort of optimize their mate choice decisions. And so what all of this is saying is that what we're calling the wrong um, behavior, Mr. Wrong, for these females is actually Mr. Right. And so basically, they didn't read the book on how to behave regarding hybridization, right? But at the same time, even though they sort of change, go against what say Darwin suggested about hybridization, we can still use that. What's powerful about Darwin is we can use that Darwinian framework to actually predict their behavior and understand their behavior. But the issue that then arises is, okay, well, they're doing this cool behavior. We're seeing hybridization. Is it an evolutionary dead end or are there other implications about it beyond just, oh, neat behavior, they hybridize or they don't hybridize? And so I wanna actually tell you a little bit about the work looking at one element of why hybridization might be important. And in particular, what we're evaluating right now is the possibility that hybridization might explain why these species co-occur in the first place. And so what I'm showing on the right, this is a picture of the Western United States. And so I'm showing you a distribution or range map for these two species. So the plain spadefoot, um, which is a grassland species is, is being shown in the green. So the top um, green and then the gray area. And then the Mexican spadefoot is um, the desert species is shown in the yellow and the gray there. Okay, so the gray area is where the two species actually co-occur with one another. Now, one of the things that um, we see is that the likely center of origin for the plain spadefoot is around the sort of Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado area. So basically their evolutionary birthplace. And this is grassland habitat that is much wetter, is a place where the plain spadefoot is much better adapted with their longer development time. The ponds last longer, there's more rain, more water. Okay, so we expect them to be there. And this habitat really contrasts with the Mexican spadefoot, which is found in is, and is adapted to more of a desert habitat. So the idea is that hybridization with, between the plain spadefoot and the Mexican spadefoot may have enabled the plain spadefoot to move down into this desert region. So why might we think that? Well, if we look at where the plain spadefoot is found, and if we look just um, in say parts of New Mexico or Arizona even, we find the plain spadefoot by itself only in the largest bodies of water. And this is a picture up top here of what is called a playa lake. So it's a shallow evaporative basin. And what you can see, this is, this is David, um, my husband for scale. This is a huge body of water that lasts for a very long time. So we find them by themselves there. We only find them in the shallow ephemeral pools down below when they're actually in the presence of, of the Mexican spadefoot. And so what that says to me is there's something about the presence of the Mexican spadefoot that enables them to be in this really dry ephemeral habitat. So what might be going on here? Well, one possible way that hybridization could facilitate um, movement into new habitat or adaptation to new habitat um, is if they can actually acquire genetic variation from the other species. And this is work that's now being shown not um, only in spadefoots that I'll illustrate here, but again, across the tree of life where we're getting more and more examples of this kind of process. And basically the idea is that you can acquire genes from a resident species that enables an invading species to move into that new habitat and rapidly adapt. So let me walk you through how this process might work. So let's imagine that we have two species that are adapted to different habitats. So on the left, I have the grassland adapted species, the big frog shown in blue, and on the right is the um, desert adapted species. So the yellow frog shown with the, the Sonoran cactus there. 
And below what I'm showing are what we call genotypes. So just ways of indicating genetic variation at two different genes um, for these, these two species. And so um, the capital letters are one type of genetic variant and the lowercase letters are different genetic variants. So what we call alleles. And for this example, let's pretend that the little a allele is what enables adaptation to the desert environment. So if we have hybridization, then what will happen is that the hybrids that I'm now showing on the right in green will carry genetic genes, uh, genetic variants, so alleles from both parents. So they'll be, have both big A's and little A's, big B's and little B's. And if they were to mate to a grassland species, um, toad, some of their offspring, not all, but some of their offspring are now going to carry that little a allele, that genetic variant that allows them to adapt to the desert environment. So this is a way that you can basically by hybridization have a bridge that moves adaptive genes into the other species. And the question is, okay, do we see this in the spadefoots? And again, the short answer to that is yes, we do. So what I'm showing you here is um, that range map again, that distribution map, but now it's only for the plain spade foot. And I've color coded it based upon the frequency of this ge of genetic variation from the Mexican spade foot. So this is all, the, so this is the plain spade foot. And the, so the black dots are showing you um, samples or populations. And what the green is saying is that in this region, there's no genetic background, no genes, no genetic variants from the Mexican spadefoot toads. But what happens is that in Texas and in the panhandle of Oklahoma, so where these two species start encountering each other, all of a sudden genetic variants from the Mexican spadefoot are showing up in our populations of plain spadefoots. And what we see is that, that those genes are then maintained across the desert um, populations. And in fact, in the westernmost populations in these playa habitats where the Mexican spadefoot doesn't even occur, the plain spadefoot still has those genetic variants from the Mexican spadefoot. So the way we're interpreting this is that there's something about this gene or other genes associated with it that are what is responsible for allowing the plain spadefoot to be in this desert habitat. And so that's something that um, we're currently exploring in the lab. But what I wanna highlight is that it's not just spadefoots that necessarily do this. And in fact, it may actually account for even aspects of our own evolutionary history. So what I'm showing you here is a picture of the Tibetan Plateau. And on the Tibetan Plateau, it's very hard to live here for humans because the oxygen levels are quite low. And the people on the Tibetan Plateau have a unique variant of what is called the EPAS1 gene. This gene is responsible for um, basically regulating uh, blood oxygen levels. And in, in sequencing and including sequencing these archaic humans, what has been found is that it appears that this EPAS1 gene is um, due to an or uh, hybrid origin. So it basically seems to have derived from hybridization with those Denisovan ants, um, other, the Denisovan archaic species that I mentioned at the beginning, okay? So it's possible that hybridization in our own background, maybe the Denisovans were already adapted to high elevation living, we don't know, but hybridization may have allowed us to acquire genetic variants that enabled us to move into a habitat and adapt to it rapidly. So all of this is leading us to say, okay, hybridization matters. So it's not just that hybridization happens, hybridization actually matters in terms of thinking about biodiversity. And so this interbreeding between species um, can be really important. And in, in contrary to the way Darwin thought about it, it can actually be favored by natural selection and have important consequences for the kinds of traits and behaviors that evolve. But what we can also see is that it's not all or nothing. So we often characterize, you know, scientists do this. It's either really bad, you know, hybridization's bad or hybridization's good. It turns out it's, it's 
both, right? And that um, it can depend on the habitat that um, it, that animals are, um, that in organisms are in. Um, but and I didn't talk about this. It can even depend on individuals, and I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that in the Q and A. But basically, what this can do is have important consequences, such as determining where biodiversity is distributed, um, or even gen generating novel genetic combinations that can speed adaptation. So if we go back then to our birthday boy and thinking about the implications of this, um, there are many who are seeing these kinds of data and advocating for changing our metaphor for life and suggesting that maybe we need to think in terms of a web or a net or maybe a braided stream. Um, I guess I'm not there yet. Um, I'm I, as much, I love studying hybridization, but I'm not ready to throw out the tree yet, I guess, because I'm also a Darwinian. Um, and so I kind of tend to think of it more like a, an impressionist painting. So this is a, a painting by Monet um, of a tree. And one of the beauty, you know, fun things about impressionist paintings is that you stand back from it and you see the, you see the structure very clearly. But when you get up close to it, you see that the, the fudging and the fuzzing and the details are both really incredibly interesting, but they also blur that sort of overall all structure. So I guess I would advocate for keeping the tree, but maybe making it more of an impressionist um, painting. So Monetifying it. We can hybridize them, Monet and Darwin. So the other thing though, that I wanna highlight beyond just thinking about the metaphor and Damon mentioned this, we are currently undergoing a biodiversity crisis and we're basically chopping down the tree of life. So 39% um, of plants and just thinking in terms of animals with backbones um, shown here, these groups um, to the right, we see almost 40% of amphibians, 20% of reptiles, 14% um, of birds and a quarter of all mammal species are at risk of extinction right now. And that's a major threat and it's across the tree of life and it's only expected to increase. Those numbers are not expected to get any better anytime soon. And so hybridization potentially though is an important thing that we need to consider in light of the biodiversity crisis. And what I've been emphasizing today is that there are some good elements to hybridization that may have impacts about how biodiversity this crisis unfolds. So for example, hybridization can speed adaptation to a changing world. And we're always see, already seeing incidents where hybridization is facilitating responses to climate change, for example. The other thing though that hybridization can do is provide sources of genetic variation for populations that become so small that they lose genetic variation. And I don't have, uh, time to talk about this today, but it can also be used to understand the genetic basis um, for disease. And this goes to trying to understand um, Darwin's perplexity of why you get sterility and, and things like that. And again, I can talk about that more in the question and answer. But having said this, I don't, I, and I don't want you all to leave here thinking that hybridization is all good. Okay. I do not want to be a Pollyanna about this because there is real bad to hybridization as well. So one of the just practical elements of hybridization is that it can confound policies protecting endangered species. So if we do not have a good idea of how to incorporate the presence of hybrids into um, protection plans, that can be a real issue. And we saw this with um, debates over red wolf conservation, for example. The other issue though, just in terms of the biology is that although I focused on species where you can have hybridization and still maintain their distinct qualities like the spadefoots, there are some species though where so much interbreeding has occurred, they, they lose their distinctiveness and we lose species as a result. Basically species go extinct as a result of hybridization. This has already happened in species of cichlid fish where um, pollution basically broke down the, that reproductive isolation. And as a result of hybridization, species were lost. It can also just result in the entire replacement of species, especially when they're rare, their gene pool basically gets absorbed. And there has been historically some speculation that maybe that it was hybridization with us that drove Neanderthals extinct. And then finally, 
as we think and become more able to do genetic manipulations in natural populations, hybridization can contribute to the unintended, unintended movement of those genes. And as we think about the ethics of doing genetic manipulation in natural populations, hybridization needs to be a part of the story as well. So why am I going on about this? Well, we expect hybridization to be more common in a changing world. And the reason for that is, is sort of twofold. First of all, humans are really good, either intentionally or unintentionally, at moving species around where they don't belong. And an example of that um, are lionfish, but there are a lot of examples. And you know, I, the, like the botanical garden can highlight all of the ways in which um, species get established that don't belong in a particular habitat. And as you introduce new species, you introduce risk of hybridization with the species that are already there. Another factor that's happening is climate change especially, um, but also just changes to habitat and habitat loss are causing species that are adapted to particular habitats like this pica here to try to basically move and follow their ranges as those ranges shift. And again, that's resulting in species interacting with each other that they haven't encountered before, especially in their recent evolutionary history. And so if we go back to the beginning where, um, you know, I talked about reproductive isolation, those mechanisms typically only evolve when those species are actually encountering each other and hybridizing. And so if species haven't seen each other before, that isolation's not there. And so again, we get enhanced risk of hybridization. So we expect this to become a more pressing problem um, as we move forward into the future. So if we come back to where I began, um, trying to understand um, diversity. So what I hope that I've shown you today is that hybridization is uh, potentially a really important um, element to understanding how biodiversity arises and where it occurs. Um, and as we think about Darwin, one of the things that you can see is that it still remains a really exciting question and an exciting time to try and understand um, the answer to these questions. We can use a Darwinian framework, even though Darwin didn't quite get everything right about it, but we can still use that general perspective to understand these issues. So with that, I wanna thank you and I will be happy to take any questions. So if there's a question, raise your hand and I will come over with these microphones so that the people at home and in this room can hear you at the same time. On the hybrid frogs, uh -huh. how does the sound change after they've hy hybrided? <laughs> yeah, no, so the, actually, so the hybrid male calls are intermediate between the two parent types. And so it, in, in, especially when you get a plain spade foot and a Mexican spade foot, those males sound, the hybrid males sound like right in between the two. And so, um, and, and that's important because then females can avoid those males because they're sterile. The issue though, and this becomes, this is part of, um, gets really cool, is that the hybrid females though can mate back to either of the parents. And so those sons start to have calls that look like the dads of the other species. So the more genetically similar they get to the Mexican spadefoot, the more their calls sound like Mexican spadefoots, and the more genetically similar they get to plain spadefoots, the more they sound like the plain spadefoot. And then all of a sudden it starts to get hard for females to tell the difference between males that have more hybrid background and males that don't have a hybrid background. And that has all sorts of fun implications for their behavior that we're still trying to sort out and figure out. Yeah. There was a question here. Um, for the other species, the Mexican species, is there like a negative effect of this hybridization? Like it benefits the plains, but. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, so I emphasize that there's this asymmetry. So the Mexican spadefoot, when they mate with the, when the Mexican spadefoot females mate with a plain spadefoot male, they have, the, the tadpoles are, are really messed up. They have really low survival. And the other feature is that they also have slower development time. Part of this goes to this intermediate issue. So the hybrids are intermediate. So the plain spadefoot has slow development. 
the Mexican spadefoot has fast development, the tadpoles are right in the middle. And so if you're a hybrid, you have faster development than a plain spadefoot, but you have slower development than a Mexican spadefoot. So it's always bad for a Mexican spadefoot female to hybridize because those tadpoles developed more slowly. And then on top of that, there are all these genetic problems that arise from that direction of the cross as opposed to the other direction of the cross. So, and there's lots of really cool reasons for why you get that directionality. Um, so yeah. let's take a couple from the web. Thank you, Johnny. Um, so we had a lot of questions about reproduction um, mm -hmm. of the of these hybrid species. Um, so with a sterile male hybrid and a fertile female hybrid, does the female then need to mate with a regular male in order to reproduce? Yes, that's correct. And so they, the hybrid females essentially then become the bridge where genes from the one species can move to the other species. Um, so yeah, they're basically doing that. I'll take one more from Zoom for now before we go back to folks in the room. Um, does the divergence distance between parental types affect this model? That is, does the genetic distance between the parental types predict the likelihood of gene movement and the resulting ability to, to succeed in a new habitat? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And in general, the answer is yes. So if we look over, um, you know, and, and people have done these kinds of analyses, the more different species are, the more um, incompatibilities there are. So the less likely you are to have this kind of beneficial hybridization. And so where we see um, collapse of species or species that benefit by hybridizing, um, that's often the case where you have um, more closely related species. At the same time though, you know, it's remarkable that we get this, this uh, adaptive hybridization in the spadefoots. And to me, this has provided a really interesting model to think about why does it work in the spadefoots? Because they are so different from one another. And so there's some um, been some work we've been doing uh, looking at the genetic factors that are contributing to this and the possible, and this is, uh, I don't know, this may be getting too much in the weeds, but I just love this, this is so exciting. So Darwin said that hybrids should not evolve, right? Natural selection should not favor sterility. And I can talk about why you get sterility, but what can happen is that hybrids can potentially get better. And so that's one of the things that we're looking at is the possibility that yes, you can get lots of divergence, but as hybrids are sort of exposed to selection, the things that make them incompatible, which is at the genetic level, could evolve. And so you can get hybrids recovering their fitness, so to speak, um, which is not something that Darwin really thought about. Um, how does the female know that the, if she's choosing a male, which one is better, is, is better in terms of not being so much incompatible? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we're not 100% sure. Is the, is the bottom line. But so females appear to use a simple cue to change their preferences. They seem to just be using water level. So what we do is when we do these experiments, we place the females initially on a little platform above the water, and then we look to see which they go to. And what you can do is I play, you start the speakers while they're on the platform and you can see females orienting towards their own species. And we've literally watched females jump into the water as they were heading to their own species and then go whoop, and go to the other species. So they can make this decision really quickly. Um, at the same time though, some work that I did with my colleague, Sabrina Birdmeister, who's here at UNC, has suggested, what I didn't tell you all is that it goes to this individ individual level stuff. Females who are in poor condition are the ones who are more likely to hybridize. And the reason for that is that poor condition females, they can't put as much nutrients in their eggs. And so those eggs are slower developing. So the poor condition females are the ones who are more likely to hybridize. And so we did a diet experiment where we just changed the diet for um, the toads. And if you look at the neurochemistry of their brains, it actually changes what features have different patterns of neurochemicals that make the, the calls attractive or unattractive. So there's also something happening in terms of their, their um, neurochemistry, and we're still trying to figure it all out. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, okay. I think you probably answered what I was going to ask, which was how they um, how they can tell or why they tell. But is there a difference in like a straight plain spade foot female and a hybridized one as to who they whom they choose to mate with? Yeah. Or is it just the conditions in the environment at the time? Yeah, so that that's a great question. And so we don't entirely know how the hybrids behave. Um, what's actually kind of interesting is so the, the Mexican spadefoot and the plain spadefoot females have very different patterns of preference. Um, and their hybrids have different, they're, they're highly variable in terms of what their preferences are. Um, am I going too far the other way? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we see with the hybrids, which is a little weird, okay, is that under some conditions, the hybrid females prefer the hybrid males, which they shouldn't do, right? That will make it an evolutionary dead end. But they seem to have inherited this behavior of plasticity. And if you alter the conditions where they're choosing, they choose their, they choose, they switch their preferences as well. They'll stop preferring hybrids and they actually start preferring the Mexican spadefoot, which is more common. So we're trying to figure out, we can, so this is where hybrids are really powerful is that we know what the parents' traits are and we have their genetic backgrounds. We can look at the hybrids and we can actually use the presence of hybrids and their traits to try and get at the genetic basis and some of the neurobiological basis of these behaviors. And that's that's kind of what we're doing right now um, is to try and get at this. Yeah. Is it ever advantageous to go to um, the plain space? You know, to go away from the fast production um, and getting out of the water. Yeah, so that, so, so in, you know, and I, I think this is where we're still, um, if I'm understanding the question, we don't know what the consequences are for hybrids in terms of whether the, what the offspring of hybrids look like in terms of sterility or um, uh, development time. We anticipate that it would look similar to the genetic back, what we call the genetic background that they're going to. So if a, if, a, if a hybrid made it to a plain spadefoot, they'd have slower developing offspring. And if they made it to the Mexican spadefoot, they'd have faster developing offspring. Um, but we still have to do those experiments and then raise those offspring up to look at these other downstream consequences. Um, yeah. Um, and so, well, so well, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so there's actually trade-offs though. So um, the good news, so, and this is where there may be additional complications to this story. You're right, it, should, it seems like it should always be fast development. The flip side though, is that if you develop more slowly as a tadpole, you come out larger. And so if you can come out of the pond larger, you actually have higher survival in that, period after metamorphosis because you can eat more diversity of food you're bigger so predators can't get you as readily so the the mexican spadefoot pays costs by having this really fast development and so that's i'm sorry that's one of the features that is probably counterbalancing against the plain spadefoot just running away with being fast developing so it's kind of like um one alternative to adaptive capture is the idea that maybe by hybridizing when they need to, they kind of have their cake and eat it too, in the sense that they hybridize when conditions are bad in the desert, but when they're not so bad, then you have long development time and they can actually outcompete then the Mexican spadefoot. And there's all sorts of other additional factors that happen with that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, that's a great point. Well, speaking of cake, I know we have a lot of uh, hungry folks in the room here. <laughs> so we're a little bit past time and we have a lot of great questions on Zoom. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them. I'm going to ask one last one that I think is very uh, fitting to this uh, talk. Okay. And um, in your opinion, is the goal of biodiversity to preserve species or to preserve genetic material? Uh, <laughs> um, so I believe in species and I think we should preserve species. Um, and so I guess I still remain um, focused on that. Having said that, one of the things that we don't appreciate that we are appreciating um, more now 
is the remarkable diversity, not just between species, but within species as well. And um, one of my graduate students here um, is actually looking at how hybridization varies because there appears to be different genetic patterns in the Mexican spadefoot. And so preserving that di diversity is also really important. So, so all of it. <laughs> so I just wanted to make one quick comment about hybridization. Um, it was during the, uh, the modern synthesis um, of uh, neo-Darwinism when Ledyard Stebbins, a botanist, evolutionary biologist, uh, recognized the importance of hybridization in plants then when they went through spontaneous polyploidy, their, um, their fertility was restored. So, so this has been uh, recognized as important plants for a long time, hybridization, polyploidy, and evolution. Oh, totally. The plant people were way ahead of all of us. <laughs> so let's thank Corinne Finnick one more time. <laughs>